ETFs are by far the best and safest way to invest in the stock market in the long term. So in today's video, I put together everything you need to know to start investing successfully without any fear or doubt. And I'm also going to show you how to actually open an account and start investing. I'm going to touch on everything you need to know from beginners concepts to even something more advanced. As you know, when you invest in a stock market, you can invest in single stocks, which are basically pieces of ownership of a company. If you buy, for example, a stock of Apple for $170, you become a shareholder of a little share of Apple. The problem with this is there are literally thousands and thousands of companies. And if you're not as smart as Warren Buffett, you're not going to be able to study long tedious financial statements to understand which company is the best to buy. So ETFs solve this problem for you. When you buy an ETF, you're buying a package that contains several companies, usually hundreds or even thousands. And don't worry, even if there are hundreds of companies, the ETF is not going to be more expensive than buying single stocks. You just get a smaller piece of many companies. There are ETFs for basically everything, for different sectors, different countries. For example, you can buy an ETF that contains all big companies in the technology sector, or even an ETF for crypto or for real estate. Now you might have heard of index funds. Index funds and ETFs are almost the same thing, so whatever I say here about ETFs is going to be valid also for index funds. To keep it easy, the most important difference is that you can buy ETFs anytime during the day, like stocks, while index funds can be bought only once a day at the price that they reach when the market closes. If you're starting with little money, then ETFs may be a better option, as they have lower minimum investment thresholds, many brokers don't charge a trading commission. So why would you want to buy ETFs or index funds instead of single stocks? There are many advantages, and the first one is diversification. If you were to invest in single stocks, you'd have two choices. Either you are really passionate and also as competent as Warren Buffett that you can read long financial statements and understand if a company will go well in the future, or you're gambling because you don't know exactly what's going to happen to the company. I know everybody wants to believe he's able to pick the right stocks, but the truth is that none of us really has the tools and experience like Buffett or other great investors. So here come ETFs to the rescue, because you don't have to bet on a company, you're investing in a whole pack of hundreds of companies, and if some of them drop in value, others will increase in value, and the overall performance of the ETF will tendentially be positive in the long term. Before 2000, all tech companies in the world saw a huge increase, which ended with a huge crash in the year 2000 called the dot-com bubble burst. All technology companies dropped up to 80-90% in value, and if you bought, for example, the company Intel in the year 2000, which is still a pretty famous company, thinking you would have made you money in the future, right now, after 20 years, you still have less than half than the money you invested in 2000. By buying the whole technology sector instead, through an ETF or an index fund, from 2004 to today, you'd have made eight times your investment. Another advantage of owning an ETF is that the way in which the companies inside are selected is automatic and follows famous market indexes. This is called passive investing. On the other hand, if you give your money to an active manager or invest in a so-called actively managed fund, the companies within the fund are gonna be chosen and traded by an active fund manager, which is gonna pick individual stocks in the hope of outperforming the market. And this has proven to have terrible results compared to passive investing. According to the research from S&P Global, active mutual fund managers, both in the United States and abroad, consistently underperforms the benchmark index. For instance, over the 20 years period ended with 2023, 97.4% of all professionally managed portfolios in the US underperformed their benchmarks. And this is, by the way, the key distinction between index funds and mutual funds. Index funds, like ETFs, are usually passively managed. Mutual funds are usually actively managed. So now I want to reassure you of two fears people usually have when they start investing. But first, if you haven't done it, consider subscribing to my channel if you're interested in finance and want to learn it in an easy way. Now, the first fear was also my fear when I started investing, and it was, what if I lose all my money? Well, as opposed to investing in single stocks, or investing in other assets like crypto, when investing in broad-based ETFs and index funds, you're investing in whole markets, sectors, and countries like the US. So the probability of losing all your money is basically the same as if the whole country went bankrupt. Pretty low. Take a look at this chart, which shows the return you'd have on average per year for 20 years, depending on when you start investing. The chart might seem complicated, but what you need to see is that no matter when you started investing since the beginning of the stock market in 1919, you would have always had a positive average annual return by keeping your money invested for 20 years, and this return is represented by the blue bars. Second fear is, 
What if I make the wrong choices? Well, investing in ETFs instead of single stocks or other assets is going to reduce so much the number of choices you have to make because it's super easy and super well diversified that you really can make anything wrong if you follow some simple rules. So if investing in ETFs and index funds is really so easy and everybody can win, why do people still buy individual stocks? Well, for the same reason why people like buying lottery tickets or playing at the casino in the hope of above average results. But statistically, you're gonna achieve a better long-term return with ETFs and index funds than with single stocks. Now let's move to how to actually start investing and opening a brokerage account. In the process of investing is literally just gonna be moving some money from your checking account to an investment account and buying an ETF or a stock with a couple of clicks. It's actually pretty easy. These are some of the most common brokerages or investment accounts that you can open no matter what country you're from. For the US, the most common investment brokerages are Schwab, Fidelity, and Vanguard. But most young people use apps like Webull or Robinhood which are also completely fine. If you come from the UK, you can use Trading212. And from Europe, you can use Trading212 or Trade Republic. And if you use the link in the description below or scan the QR code here, you're gonna get a free stock with a value of up to $100 by signing up. Now, depending on your country, with these brokers, you're gonna be able to open a normal investing account and also a tax advantage account. For example, if you live in the US, you should absolutely make use of a Roth IRA, which is a type of investment account that lets your investments grow tax-free and you can withdraw them tax-free if you wait until you are 59 years and a half of age. The only limitation is the amount you can invest every year, which is $6,500 if you're younger than 50, otherwise $7,500. Another interesting account in the US is the so-called 401k, which is a workplace retirement plan that lets you invest annual contributions up to a certain limit, and employer also matches your contribution up to 100%. In the other countries, you may find similar conditions. For example, an equivalent of the Roth IRA in the UK is the ISA. In Canada, TFSA and Super in Australia. Now, to be more practical, let me guide you through opening an account with Vanguard through the website and Weibo through the app. On Vanguard's personal investor homepage, you need to select open an account. Assuming you're going to be using your bank to make your initial investment, you'd select the first choice. After clicking sign up on the I'm new to Vanguard option, you're shown an overview of the next steps and the whole process of opening an account will take you 5 to 10 minutes. Then you need to select the type of account you want. The first is the IRA, like a traditional IRA or the Roth IRA. And the second is a normal investing account. You're going to be asked for the typical information like address, phone and so on. And remember that investment accounts are like banks, so they need to ask you this information just like a bank would. Some questions might seem inappropriate to you, like info about your employment, income and net worth, but they have to do it just because it's required by law. Once your account has been accepted within three to seven days and your money reaches your new account, you can start investing and you're gonna be able to buy ETFs, index funds, stocks, and much more. Here's a list of ETFs from Vanguard, but don't freak out. I'll explain later how to choose the best ETFs and which are the ones you should focus on. Vanguard does also have an app, but to show you how to set up a brokerage from your phone, I'm gonna use Weibo. By the way, the process of creating an account and buying ETFs is the same for all brokers. So if you know how to do it with one, you're gonna be able to manage with any broker. First thing you do is download and open a Weibo app on your phone. Click on open account, look at the bottom of the screen and then you have to identify using an ID. Step two is filling in your personal information just as they appear in your ID and then your employment information just like we've seen from Banger. You then answer some questions about your investment objectives, your finances and you confirm. The next step is to choose your account type. Choose cash account because right now you don't want to deal with margins and choose stocks and ETFs as securities. Webull usually requires 24 hours to review your application and then you're going to be ready to go. Now let's talk about how you can actually find the best ETFs to invest in. This is probably one of the most important parts because I'm going to show you exactly how you can actually look for ETFs and find the best ones. What you're looking at right here is a website called Vetify. It's a great database of all existing ETFs and you can use it to filter the best ones per asset class, fees, returns, holdings, and many other factors. So what are the most important parameters of an ETF? The first is the total assets or assets under management, which is the amount of money that is managed within the ETF. Generally speaking, the higher the value, the more trusted the ETF is. So by sorting per total assets under management, you can be sure that the first ETFs are the most famous in the world and are also wonderful choices. Notice that the first three are all called S&P 500. So what is that? The S&P 500 is a list of the 500 best performing public companies in the US like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tesla, 
and embraces all sectors of the economy, so it's wonderfully diversified. It can be bought as an ETF from different brokerages, but you don't have to have an account with that brokerage to buy it. For example, the S&P 500 ETF from Vanguard, which is called VOO, can be bought even using apps like Weibo. And the S&P 500 is such a good combination of companies that even Warren Buffett recommends it to the majority of investors because it's simple, diversified, and complete. The S&P 500 index, formerly called the Composite Index, grew from inception in 1928 through the end of 2022 with an average of 9.82% per year. So we have a long-term history, almost 100 years, with a gain of almost 10% per year. Now, another important parameter of the ETFs that you need to consider is the so-called expense ratio, that you're gonna find on an ETF database by clicking on expenses and represents the percentage of your portfolio value that you're gonna have to pay every year as fee. Notice that the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF VOO has the lowest expense ratio possible with 0.03%. Obviously, the expense ratio must be as low as possible, and usually when you buy a really famous ETFs with a high number of total assets, the expense ratio is going to be extremely low. There are other factors you should look at, like the number of holdings, performance, and dividend yield. But for a detailed explanation of how to actually choose the best ETFs and how to easily set up a free ETF screener, you should watch this video. Of course, after you finish, with this one. Unfortunately, I can't really say everything in this video, otherwise it would be 40 minutes long and nobody would watch it. What I can do though, is give you a couple of names which are for sure amongst the best ETFs around. You're gonna see them here on my left. So starting from the first one, it's VO which I mentioned earlier. VO is the S&P 500 ETF from Vanguard and contains 500 of the best performing companies in the US stock market. The good news is that you can buy most American ETFs even from the rest of the world only the ticker is gonna be different. So for example, if you wanna buy this ETF from Europe, you're gonna find it as VUAA. The easiest way though is to search the whole name in your brokerage account. So for example, write Vanguard S&P 500 ETF instead of VO, and you're probably gonna find it almost everywhere in the world. Another great ETF is VTI, which is the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF. This ETF includes not only the best 500 companies, but all the companies in the US stock market. We are talking about over 4,000 companies, so literally for this ETF to perform bad in the long term, you need to have the US go bankrupt permanently. A great ETF which not only contains stable, safe companies, but also pays really good dividends every year is SCHD the Schwab US Dividend Equity ETF. This is probably the most loved dividend ETF in the world, and you're gonna find a lot of videos about it in my channel. If you don't know what they are, dividends are money you're going to receive directly on your account, usually every three months, just by owning the ETF. While SHD tends to include value companies that pay dividends, if you're interested in companies that focus on strong growth and the four are going to appreciate more in value but without giving you a lot of dividends, QQQ is one of your best choices. QQQ is the Invesco QQQ Trust Series 1 and contains the best 100 growth companies including in the Nasdaq index. To expand over the US market, you have basically two options. If you are from the US, I would suggest something like VEA, the Vanguard FTSC Developed Markets ETF, which offers exposure to developed markets outside of North America, like Western Europe, Japan, and Australia. If instead you are not from the US, you could go for a world ETF. In general, the markets outside of the US don't perform as well as the US. So this number five is not necessarily one of the best five ETFs in existence, but it's definitely one of the best choices for diversifying worldwide. Now, when you look for an ETF or a stock to buy in your investment account, you're gonna find the unit price, the price of a single unit. For example, the S&P 500 ETF from Vanguard is trading at around $400, but this price is absolutely no meaning to you because since a couple of years, we have the option to buy the so-called fractional shares. So instead of buying a whole unit for $400, you can buy a small portion of it for like $1. This is the major reason why you shouldn't care about the unit price of an ETF but it's not the only one. Another reason is that the unit price doesn't give you any information at all about the value of an ETF or a stock. It's not like the price tag of some shoes. And the reason is that when a company goes public and gets valued a certain net worth, they decide how many shares they want to divide this value in. So let's say that a new company goes public and gets valued at $1 billion, they can decide to create a billion shares, each valued $1, or they could just create two shares 
each valued half a billion. So the value of a single share doesn't tell you anything about the value of a company. It was relevant in the past because we were forced to pay at least that amount because you didn't have fractional shares, but not anymore. Let's say now that you pick an ETF and you want to understand something more about it. For whatever ETF, when you Google it, you're gonna find the official page that shows everything you need to know. Let's take, for example, the S&P 500 from Vanguard, VO. First important information, what kind of index it is. It's domestic, so focus on the US, it's large plan, so it includes large companies which are partially value and partially growth companies. It has a dividend yield of 1.48%, meaning it gives you every year 1.48% of the value you possess back as dividends. And it has a 0.03% expense ratio, meaning every year you pay 0.03% of all the value that you possess in fees. Scrolling down to performance, you see that since inception in 2010, it has given an average annual return of around 13.7%. 12.8% in the past 10 years, 11% in the past five, and so on. Really solid numbers, by the way, as you can see. Scrolling more down, you get to a really interesting part that shows you how the sectors are covered inside the ETF. You have a high percentage in information technology, which is the strongest growing sector, while others like utilities and materials have barely two or 3%. After that, you can see the list of the companies included in the ETF. The S&P 500 is going to include all famous companies that you know, like Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Tesla, Facebook and so on. If you look for other ETFs from other investing companies, the page layout might be a little different, but this is usually the data you find. A really important concept is dividends. I told you before that dividends are an amount of money that the company pays to the shareholders, usually every three months. And if you own ETFs, you're a shareholder in hundreds of companies, so you're usually gonna receive dividends. Generally speaking, to explain it simple, you have two kinds of companies. Companies that give back their earnings to the shareholders as dividends, and companies that instead invest their earnings back into the growth of the business. Of course, the world is not black and white, so companies can do both. But usually we can say that growth companies like Apple, Meta, Tesla, and so on, tend to pay as little dividends as possible because they want to grow faster. Other mature companies that maybe don't have so much growing possibility anymore, like Coca-Cola, tend to pay good and stable dividends every year instead. The choice if you want to focus more on growth or value is yours. But what I can suggest to you is that if you choose value and receive dividends, as long as you are young, you should always reinvest the dividends you receive because they're going to help you grow your portfolio faster. So my suggestion is to set up a dividend reinvestment plan, a so-called DRIP. So what happens is that when you earn a dividend, Dividend, that money is automatically reinvested back into buying more shares of the same ETF. This process of constantly reinvesting your dividends back into buying more ETFs, which earns you even more dividends in the future, is what makes you grow faster and faster because it creates an exponential growth of your wealth. One of my biggest questions when I first started was, should I invest all my money at the same time or do it gradually? Well, there are moments in which it's better to invest a lump sum. For example, after a big crash, you know that the stocks and ETFs are going to be cheap compared to the real value. But in general, for most investors, the best way to invest is using the dollar cost averaging method. This simply means investing the same amount every month, every year, regardless of the current value of the ETFs. This method is great for many reasons. It's easier to budget your salary and say, for example, 15% goes every month to the S&P 500. You can easily automate the process with your brokerage app so you don't have to think about anything. You're actually going to get a better return in the long term because the truth is we are humans and we make emotional disasters. So whenever an ETF has grown a lot in price, namely it's expensive, we buy more because we are hyped by the recent growth. And whenever the market crashes and ETFs are actually cheap to buy, we buy less because we're afraid. Now, how much should you actually invest? This is a question I get asked a lot of times and the answer depends on your income and your final goal. But to help you define how much you need to invest, I prepared a Google table, which I'm gonna make available to you for free through the link in the description below or by scanning this QR code. Now this table tells you how how rich you're gonna become in the years to come depending on how much you invest. For example, let's say you start with an initial capital of zero and you want to invest in the S&P 500 that, as I said, for the last 100 years gave an average annual return of 9-10%. Let's put 9% here. Now this is where it gets interesting because by writing how much you're going to invest every month, you can see how much your wealth grows every future year. For example, if I invest $500 every month, after 10 years I'm going to have $96,000. After 20 years, $343,000. And after 40 years, I have over 2.3 million. And this 
having only invested 240,000 in a lifetime. As I said, you can unload the table for free from here or from the description. I have nothing in return, but please be kind and drop a beautiful like to this video to help me with the YouTube algorithm. Now, another question that everyone asks is, when should I start? Schwab proved that trying to time the market is always a bad choice. The research studied the performance of five hypothetical long-term investors following different investment strategies. Each received $2,000 at the beginning of every year for the 20 years and in 2022 and invested the money in the S&P 500. Peter Perfect was a perfect market timer and was able to place his $2,000 into the market every year at the lowest price of the year. Ashley Action took a simple, consistent approach. Each year, she invested her $2,000 right away. Matthew Monthly divided his $2,000 into 12 equal portions, which he invested then at the beginning of each month using the dollar cost averaging method. Rosie Rotten had incredibly poor timing. She invested her $2,000 each year at the worst, most expensive moment of the year. Larry Linger, well, Larry left his money in cash. He was convinced that it was better to wait for the next crash before investing, so he ended up never investing his money. And here's the wealth of our five friends after 20 years. There are many conclusions you can draw from this, but the most interesting one is that even Rosie Rotten, which always invested in the worst moment of the year, ended up with double as much money as Larry, which did invest at all. And the difference with Peter, which always invested in the best moment of the year, isn't even so big. So when is the right time to invest in the stock market? The right time is now. Even more considering that the last crash was in 2021, 2022, and even today, the price of the S&P 500 is still lower than the peak price of 2021. If this video was helpful, consider subscribing to my channel to stay tuned on future videos and drop a beautiful like to this video. And thank you, thank you so much for watching until the end. I wish you a wonderful for the evening and as always I'll see you in the next video. Ciao!